I wanted to talk a little bit about the considerations for success of these, these various deck treatments and um, some of the questions that came up. The, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, what's considered a sound substrate. Spencer did a good job of talking about this. Comes up all the time, what kind of matrix or matrices or decision trees are out there to determine what's a good condition for various deck treatments. Comes up all the time. And there's a lot of data out there and um, I think erring on the more conservative side has always been my position. As a manufacturer's representative, it's always good to have a high level of communication with the owners as far as assessing the condition of the deck, if it's a good, a good candidate for the particular treatment. And then the other thing that comes up is uh, surface prep. So between the condition of the deck and the surface prep, choosing the right condition um, for the right treatment and making sure you have the right prep. And then we want to talk about how do you mitigate these potentials for failure of various systems. And if you do have some type of failure, what can you do about it? So let's talk about that. Um, the biggest thing I was, I was talking to uh, Robert from BYU a little while ago during lunch, and I don't know if this is always considered, but I think the biggest consideration is the thermal relationship the overlay system has with the deck itself. So various overlay systems are going to expand and contract at different rates than the deck concrete itself which will in turn transfer some of those stresses to the bond line uh, between the overlay and the concrete substrate itself. So that's why it's, more, it's very important that you have a sound, stub, sound substrate. So what is a sound substrate? And th this is the question that everybody asks. Um, like I said, there's a lot of different matrix out there. We talk about tensile strength of the deck, talk about uh, map cracking, corrosion, corrosion potential, spalling and things like that. Uh, Dwayne was talking earlier in one of our sessions about uh, what Washington does, and they're pretty conservative. They look at less than one to 2% uh, delaminations of concrete, mostly caused by the corrosion of the reinforcing steel. Uh, some of the manufacturers out there, and there's some data out there to potentially support this, could allow as much as 25 or 30%. Now I think when you get to that situation, you have a lot of corrosion potential throughout the deck, and it's probably not a good, good candidate for uh, most of these polymer, especially polymer type overlay systems. You can see the one photograph there. A lot of that deck is patched, map cracking. Once you see map cracking type patterns, typically you have corrosion, or you might have ASR or something like that, but if you have map cracking type patterns, it's probably not a good candidate for any type of surface overlay system. Might be a good candidate for deck sealing treatment to give you a little bit of time, seal the cracks and things like that. Um, and then um, patching systems need to be compatible with the overlays as well. Now we could talk all day about how do you determine what is a sound substrate, but when you talk about some of these thin polymer overlay systems, I think you do need to err on the side of conservative. Um, the state of Utah installs these on new decks. Spencer talked about why, you know, after, um, you know, one year you have enough, in, at least here in the state of Utah, enough uh, chloride content at the top mat of reinforcing steel that you have corrosion potential once you go past that. So I, th I think it's a good idea to consider that as a factor and install these things earlier rather than later. Uh, New Mexico was talking earlier in one of our sessions. They had a different philosophy, and their philosophy was let the deck go through its initial cracking process. Um, I use the term the deck is in a more of a, a relaxed state. Uh, there's a lot of stress in a new deck. It wants to shrink. It wants to crack. And once it goes through that process, it's in a more relaxed state. You put the overlay on top of it, and the overlay, there, there's it's already in a relaxed state. But ultimately, I think it's better to, you know, as far as putting a thin overlay, to do it earlier rather than later. Uh, there's calculations you can do. This data is out there. If you understand the coefficient of thermal expansion of your overlay system, I've seen some recent data to suggest that these thin overlays may have five times the coefficient of thermal expansion as uh, concrete bridge deck. 
And the way we design these things is they have some give, they have some flexibility, so that therefore, even though they're expanding at a different rate, when the concrete is expanding, they're going through a relaxing process and they're kind of letting go. That's why the substrate has to be in good condition. The other thing is with these particular overlays, in this photograph here, um, one state decided that they thought three layers must be better than two layers. So when you start going with three layers, you're making a system that is flexible and forgiving, a lot more rigid and a lot less forgiving. This particular deck doesn't look like it's in bad shape. Maybe the, the surface was overfinished. Uh, maybe the, the paste itself was weak. But what happened is the stress between the overlay system and the concrete was greater than the concrete itself could handle, and the overlay debonded with the concrete attached. And the, so that's a thermal compatibility issue right there. And like I said, you can calculate this stuff. I mean, I, I can't, but if, if you could read that formula and you can gather all the data, you could calculate the stress at the particular bond line with various systems. So that's why it's critical. So, okay, you look at the deck condition. The other thing that is most critical is surface prep. And I'll go back to an example I was talking about earlier today uh, here in the state of Utah years ago when I was involved with one of the first overlays here. And the, the tech rep called and said, hey, I think there's some kind of whiteness on the deck. I'm not sure. I said, I'll be there soon anyway. Just hold on. I showed up. We poured some water on the deck concrete. What it did is t made the, the concrete darker, and all of a sudden you could see a lot of curing compound on the deck. Well, what was left was in the pore structure, which is where the polymer resin binder for the overlay system goes down into to get a good mechanical interlocking into the, the deck itself. So we called the shot blast contractor back and said, you need to come back and do a better job. And, he, and his comment was, this is the way we always do it. Well, that was not a good answer. Anyway, I think, um, you know, you dot learned something, and I think we all learned something. And uh, the other thing as far as shot blasting, how do you determine what a good profile is? Another scenario, I always go and talk to the shot blasting contractor, and typically what happens is you show up, and they're driving their, their shot blaster really fast. We call that a brush blast. It's not a, in a very aggressive approach. Based on the size of the shot, the speed of the shot blaster is going to be um, correlate to the... the the depth of the profile that you want to bond to. And so I slow down and he said, well, the contractor paid me to go this fast and I can't slow down. Then you have to go talk to the contractor, the contractor gets mad at you, but that's what has to happen. The other thing, you know, removal of striping, I think you'll see in one of the next photos of a deck treat treatment application, a sealing application where they're not removing the stripes. For the overlays, you want to do that. So you can see in the bottom right there, they're pushing a scarifier removing the striping, trying not to abrade too aggressively the surface. Um, the other thing is taping of the joints and drains. Air washing is important even after shot blasting. You want to typically get a, a 180, 175, whatever CFM compressor with an air lance on there, get close, blow out all the dirt, dust and debris off that deck, and then the concrete should be dry. If there's concerns about the concrete being dry, um, there's a few things you can do. Someone was pointing out earlier, I don't know if that was here in Utah, where they, they use a torch to bring moisture up to the surface to see if it's visible. Um, I've heard of that, but I haven't seen it as common practice. The other thing, there is an ASTM test method to tape down some plastic polyfilm, two foot square. Typically, I think it's like a 16 hour test, but you can do it in two hours and get enough information to determine if, if it's dry. Now you, you, you see these uh, ICR, ICRI, International Concrete Repair Institute, profiles uh, referenced in a lot of specifications, but uh, most people don't know who they are or what they are. They don't know what they look like or what they mean. So for an inspector to see that in his specification and to have a conversation with the surface prep contractor about what his profile is supposed to look like is meaningless unless you have this particular profile. So a number 10 meaning the most aggressive, and a number one is a very light sandblasting. Um, I want to back up because I forgot to mention one thing too here. The, when you're shot blasting, you can only get so close to the, the barriers and, and things. So you got to come in there and sandblast. And if you're over water or something like that, there may be an issue with sandblasting. But 
you have to consider how you're gonna get right up to the edge because these thin overlays or whatever you're putting down, if there's, a, if there's an edge, uh, you're gonna see that's where they're gonna to wanna to debond first, anywhere there's some sort of an edge. So you do wanna get the edges as well. Then like I said, even if you specify a CSP5, which is a middle of the road CSP5 to seven, which is somewhat typical, um, often the contractors that are doing the prep don't understand what that is. So it's really up to the manufacturers and everybody to educate each other, have these RC ICRI chips profiles so you can see physically what this is supposed to look like because it's very critical um, surface prep. Like I said, there's these um, healer sealers. There's two scenarios which you might want to use these. One is the New Mexico scenario, which is you come on to the deck, treat the cracks right away, you let the deck go through some thermal cycling, things like that, but you, you treat the cracks. The other scenario is the deck is really not in a good condition. You, you don't have the money in the budget to replace it, but you want to give it a little bit of time. It's not a good idea to put some sort of a thin or polymer type overlay system on there because you're gonna induce a lot more stresses into a deck that's already in poor shape. The likelihood that you're gonna pull up some of that deck concrete or some of those old patches or something that's ready to delaminate is gonna go up. So seal the cracks, you know, do your patching and your repairs, seal the cracks, add a little bit of life, you know, buy yourself a little bit of time. So there's some other things that we wanna consider in, um, we're with these, the bridge preservation uh, task group, we're, we're putting these pocket guides together and we were looking at some of these deck treatments and going through there, I realized there's a whole lot of things that come up, a whole lot of mistakes, a whole lot of best practices things that really get thrown out um, consistently over and over and over again. And they sound like simple things, but I hope that if you pay attention and connect the dots, put it all together, you'll have a really good broad perspe perspective on why these little things add up and come end up being important. Um, I, st I start about you know talking about the type of mixer. I can't tell you how many times I've sent the contractor or even given a presentation on what pieces of equipment they should have there, what type of mixer they're gonna, if they're doing this by hand, they don't have a pump, they're mixing with a drill, they put a mixer on there. Nine out of 10 times they come with a drywall mud mixer or uh, some sort of a mortar mixer. They're not at all designed to mix these polymer resins. And the problem is often the viscosity of the various components are different. I show up on a job, as in the, the top left photo, where uh, you can't really see it. I brought a timer for these guys. It's sticking on the drum, and I brought them their Jiffy mixer, and I said, you know, it looks like there's, there's two component material. The A is pretty thick, and the B is not quite thick. If you pour the, the B, or the, the thick stuff at the bottom, and the, and the thin stuff at the top, and you go there and you're mixing, even if you mix it for three minutes, I'll go to the second bullet point, if it's cold, it's really thick, and three minutes is not gonna work, even with the right mixer. So it's a cold day, A component's really thick, B component's not as thick, they show up with their drywall mud mixer, and even if they have a timer, which they don't unless you've brought it for them, um, they go ahead and mix this stuff for three minutes, guess what, it's not mixed well enough, it's not mixed properly. The other thing, and if you look at the photo on the bottom left, it's an actual uh, site I showed up uh, I showed up on, and there was actually an axle going through the bottom of this thing, and he's in there, and he, he didn't have any Jiffy mixer. I don't even know what kind of mixer he had, some sort of mortar mixer, and there's all kinds of weird shapes at the bottom of this thing. So he pours his A or whatever in there, and that, the, that component gets mixed in down there, all those odd shapes in the bottom of the mixer. Then they throw the B in, then they take their, their mixer and shuffle it around, then they dump the stuff out on the bridge deck. And then guess what? It doesn't set up. And if you can see the guy there with the shovel, that's what it looks like. And if you could see the look on anybody's face when they turn to you after you, you told them you didn't have the right mixer, to get the right mixer, to get the right vessel, um, you're, you know, and then they get the shovel and they say, now what do we do? <laughs> so that's not fun. And you can see what it looks like. Um, you know, you don't want to be the guy there that has to get that off. And we'll talk more about that later. 
Very important stuff. And so even the proper mix ratio of, the, of these components and how to get that is, is critical, but it's not also these types of failures, it's other issues, and we're gonna talk about that as well in a minute. Here's a common thing I see all the time. Why is there a bald spot going the whole way transversely across the deck that's about you know, one or two feet wide? And so what happens is these guys are mixing this stuff. The guys that are mixing get pretty good at it. They get ahead. Um, they run out of a batch. They go back to mix some more. It's a nice warm day. And you always leave about a foot or two of just wet resin without aggregate in it. Because if you have a squeegee, and you come up there with your squeegee and you're trying to squeegee the resin around and there's a bunch of rock in it, it doesn't work so well. So you keep what we call a wet edge ahead of it. So they're, they're there, the guys with the rock stop and they, they go to mix more material and they come back and eventually, depending on how hot, now you keep in mind that these resin binders often set up much faster on a, on a hot day than they do on a cool day. So it's a warm day, they come back, they mix their stuff up, they pour it down, they keep going, they cover it with rock and they come back when they sweep off the excess rock and there's these transverse bald spots. Well, guess what? This, that little wet spot that you left there set up already and you broadcast the rock onto there and it, it's just sitting on top. You sweep it off and it's gone. Um, that can happen more extensively. In fact, um, there's a lot of fully automated equipment, pumps, um, methods of broadcasting aggregate. It's very critical, especially on a warm day, to embed the aggregate right away. Even if the uh, resin binder starts cross-linking and setting up, even if it's not physically you touch it, it doesn't seem like it's gelling up, it's already cross-linking, it's already gaining its strength. You get the rock into it a little bit too late, and it's not integrated in the system. It's not cross-linking with the aggregate and, and bonding mechanically and chemically with the aggregate like it's supposed to. So that's important. Um, they get way ahead. The other thing is a consideration, you know, the, the aggregates need to be dry. And you need to store them somewhere dry. I've shown up many times, not just once or twice, many times. It rains, they don't cover the aggregate. You can physically see that it's wet. It's not a good idea. Very important. Same with dirt. Uh, these polymer resins bond really well with dirt. But if the aggregate's covered with dirt, they'll bond really well with the dirt but they won't necessarily bond really well with the aggregate. The other question that comes up um, is friction on these bridge decks. Um, we've got some aggregate folks here. Um, we've got widespread use of this high friction surface treatment around the country. A lot of questions are being asked about long-term durability and of the friction on a bridge. Even if it's often a tangent section, um, situations like in the state of Nevada, for example, had a lot of uh, friction issues on bridge decks, and they've gone to using uh, more durable aggregates on the bridge decks. Um, I think the state of Utah is rewriting their specification. They're considering ADTs for determining where and where they may or may not want to use more durable polish-resistant aggregates on the bridge decks. The other failure mechanism that I've seen before is wear through uh, in the wheel path, typically. It's not always about chains and studded tires. Sometimes it's about other things. Let's say we go back to where we're talking about mix ratios and the materials that are being mixed are just a little bit off ratio. You sweep them, everything looks good, but what happens is they may not really have the strength that they were designed to have. You put traffic on there and right in the wheel path where you have all the shear stresses from the, the traffic riding over these overlay systems, it doesn't really have the strength it was supposed to because it was just mixed a little bit off ratio. Chances that it's going to wear through in the wheel path go up a little bit. Um, the other thing that happens often is because we're always in a hurry. Josh was talking about earlier. We've got time constraints here. Uh, maybe we're going to have lane rental charges, $10,000 for every 15 minutes that you're, you're off, that, that you're on here without returning this polymer overlay system or whatever back to traffic. Well, the contractor is going to be pushing. And if you return it to traffic a little bit too early, what happens is, then again, right in the wheel path, you're disturbing uh, the, the system itself as it's trying to cross-link and gain strength in the wheel path, because that's where the, the shear stresses are from the, the traffic driving through it. Then the potential for early wear in the wheel path goes up. Um, so you're talking about mixing, mix ratio, um, the temperatures of the material, 
because if, if it's cold, it doesn't mix as well. Um, installation temperatures, because in cooler weather, it takes longer for these things to gain strength. So you have to make sure you have proper strength before you return them to traffic. And the other thing is, hey, if you have really heavy studded snow tires and chain traffic, you're just gonna have to understand that these systems just are not gonna last as long. You could consider more durable aggregates, but ultimately, you're just not gonna get the life cycle that you would if you don't have that type of exposure. Um, I did want to talk, you know, since I'm, I'm, I am hearing more discussions about the use of uh, polyester premixed or poly premixed polymer systems that they're a little bit different than the thin systems. You're going to mix maybe 88% aggregate with less resin, put, it, put them down a little bit thicker. And different set of circumstances come into play when you consider best practices, quality control procedures. This is very broad. You know, if you're developing a specification, you really want to make sure that you consider all the best practice scenarios that come into play. The sound strips, substrate's um, critical as well. In this particular situation, there was a patch. Uh, the patch wasn't very well bonded. The patch was moving around. You put an overlay system on top of it, even though it's three quarters of an inch, it's got some strength and durability. In this situation, um, the patch the perimeter of the patch reflected through as a crack through the overlay. So you do want to sound substrate. Um, we talk about one source for the various components. I think if you have aggregates of primer or pretreatment and various components, it's good to have them for one source because the source supplier understands how the different products work together. I think it's critical. Long term, way back when in California, I think what they did is they had requirements for the pretreatment, the aggregates, and the resin binder, and the contractors would put it all together, and you wouldn't necessarily know if they were compatible, and if the contractor knew how to work with them all individually. Uh, the other thing is experience with any of these things, um, with any of them at all. I, experience helps. I see a lot of experience kind of stuff written into specifications as a requirement um, of the contractor to have some level of certification or experience. Uh, I think training is important. Um, as a manufacturer's rep, I think we all want to train the contractors, train the owners to understand. Hopefully they'll have good specifications. And then backing up all the way back to the substrate, if you walk onto a, a bridge deck, this came up in some of our uh, sessions earlier, if you're a manufacturer's representative with a certain system and you walk out onto a project and you feel that the deck itself is not sound enough to handle your system, it's not a good candidate, it's good to communicate with the inspector and any owner's representatives that are on site, but that's only one step, because typically what will happen is the, the conversation goes like this. I don't think it's going to last very long. I really don't want to put our system on your, on your bridge deck. The contractor wants to choke you, right, because you know he's being paid to do this, and you're telling me he can't do it. Um, then. Someone from the owner will say, well, we only want to get three years out of this anyway, just go ahead and do it. So everyone agrees, you go ahead and do it. Then a few years down the road when it fails, someone from a higher level comes back and says, hey, your stuff's junk, it failed, we're never using it again. And it's very typical. It was interesting, the conversations um, they had yesterday regarding the joint systems, same thing. When we were talking about these pocket guides um, for kind of gui giving guidance to the owners, the designers, spec writers, contractors, inspectors, there's a checklist with these different things. You need, really should go through this checklist and have it right in front of you and check off everything so that you know that um, you've got a good candidate for the particular activity, whether it's even a joint or a deck treatment, that it's being done properly, and that the contractor understands his role, surface prep, all those things, and the chances that you're gonna have a successful project go up dramatically. Um, forensics and repairs, I've been on enough of these things and, and, and seen a lot of it, and I think a lot of, a lot of folks here in this room have, we've got, that, that's who's here, the people that have seen these kind of failures and things. Um, I mean, I can look at these and I think it's you know, pretty easy to determine what's going on here. That photo on the top left, um, what that was was an automated installation and they decided to take their equipment apart on the bridge deck. Now, I don't know why, because, you know, when I showed up, 
a week or two later and they said, well, what do we do here? It was a mess. Um, second down from that, very visible wax, white wax concrete curing compound. It's a bond breaker, it's wax. You know, it's, it's gonna inhibit the adhesion of the polymer system. The photo of the, below that, not only was, you could see some white on there, you can kind of see an amber color, and the telltale sign that this material was mixed off ratio was that it was a warm day, and when the contractor came out to clean it and repair it, he scraped, they scraped it off, and you could take the stuff, and it was, it was basically like rubber. It was off ratio, it was like rubber. So it was poor prep, poor mixing. You know, perfect storm. Uh, upper right, anytime you have a polymer system uh, that has concrete attached to it, it's a thermal compatibility. Thermal compatibility could mean that the substrate's in poor condition. Maybe they overfinished the deck itself and there was too much water added during the finishing process. Who knows, whatever the reason being, there's incompatibility because there was a tug of war. They're both expanding and contracting at different rates and the overlay system's pretty strong and it won the tug of war and that's, that's what you get. Um, photo below that was taken, uh, it was a crack sealer. Um, sometimes on a bridge deck, whether it's design related or whatever, you have a crack that is moving a lot. It, maybe it's moving at a greater amount more than the, the, the crack sealing treatment can handle. Now, if the crack sealing treatment is on top of the crack, it's more likely that that crack, if it's moving, is going to reflect through the crack sealing treatment. If the crack is completely filled with the crack sealing treatment, it's less likely. These are all considerations, and any one of these things we could spend hours talking about. These are just guidelines, considerations. And then the other photo on the bottom right, um, you have two things going on. One thing is uh, thermal compatibility issue. The substrate was unsound. The overlay system was stronger than the uh, substrate itself. But guess what? If you look, you're looking at the bottom of what came off. So what's really on the ground is the overlay. What's in between that is the repair mortar. And what you're looking at on the top is uh, the, the, the bridge deck itself. It looks to me that there was, they did some patching. And why did they leave about uh, three-eighths of an inch of unsound concrete over the top of uh, corroding reinforcing steel makes no sense. Actually, if you have exposed reinforcing steel and you're doing some patching, it's a good idea, I was looking at some photos earlier, it's a good idea to get under the reinforcing steel. So the patching mortar, and this is basic concrete repair guidelines, the, the repair material can get under, you know, about the diameter of your finger under the reinforcing steel. Well, they, they didn't do that at all here. Um, so anyway, uh, real quick, I want to finish up. I know, I, hopefully I'm not going past my time. Going back to that, that first situation, you have some repair, uh, polymer resin mixed off ratio, what do you do? You come out there, guy's got a scarifier. He's removing as much as he can. Very time consuming. Next situation, he comes in and sandblast. Sandblast and get it as clean as possible. And then you can come back and you can do your repair and you can try to blend it in. Typically, it's not gonna be perfectly smooth. The ride's not gonna be perfect. But you did a repair and you move on. That's all you can do in these types of situations. Um, this particular deck, um, why don't you wanna use a roto mill on a deck to repair for patching? And I think we've already had this discussion and I don't know if you guys were paying attention because a 30 pound chipping hammer is pretty light when you take a big, huge piece of machinery that's bouncing and literally you could stand 100 feet away from this thing and the whole deck is shaking. You're mi macro, micro fracturing the whole substrate that you're trying to bond anything to, whether it's a patching material or an overlay system. Bad idea. Um, so consider ambient conditions, storage conditions, workmanship, proper equipment, skill level. Skilled manufacturer's rep, we had this discussion earlier, it gets busy, you need a manufacturer's rep. You hope that uh, this particular male or female, whoever they show up, that they know what they're talking about and they're gonna provide good guidance. And the other thing is sound substrate. We already talked about all that. That's kind of it. I hope that was, um, I guess we can wait to see if anyone has questions uh, in these guys. So we're kind of going backwards. We did the third part first. 
We are, we, as Greg said, we started a little backwards here, but um, as industry reps, um, we just want to present to you a, just a general overview of the different uh, deck preservation materials that are uh, out there for you uh, to use in, in the polymers. Um, I'm specifically going to focus on the desired results of using these products, and then um, Clay's going to uh, kind of delve a little deeper into the various uh, polymer products that are available uh, to be used for these types of treatments. Um, so the basic treatment applications here, um, I'm going to kind of go over what you should expect for using them as far as a, a life expectancy. Um, I'm going to kind of cover uh, concrete deck spalling, uh, expansion joint headers, uh, concrete crack and surface sealing, and uh, thin waterproofing uh, wearing surface overlays. So um, going to uh, concrete uh, spalling and deck spalling. Um, untreated spalls, uh, as, we, as we know, uh, allow moisture in. It reduces the uh, amount of cover over the rebar and re-steel. So it causes corrosion and it also causes additional deterioration to the uh, bridge deck. Um, we also know that uh, spalls create uh, safety hazards for vehicles. Who doesn't love running into potholes as you're driving over a bridge deck? Um, so we want the treatment to basically restore the original riding surface. And we also want the material to exhibit a uh, high bond to the existing concrete. And we want it to the, uh, eliminate the recurrence of uh, spalls in the future. Um, and the key to this, I, I, we want to have uh, those that are the end users of our products to uh, follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendations as far as uh, uh, surface prep, which is what Greg covered, um, also uh, for mixing the materials and for uh, placement as well. Um, and Greg's already said that we definitely want, uh, if, if it's available to you, and it is available to you, we want to be out there when you install these products. We want to be there on the project uh, to oversee and to make sure that what is getting put down is getting put down correctly. Um, we also want the uh, deck spalling repairs to be waterproof. Uh, we want to eliminate further steel corrosion. We also want to have a rapid cure in wide temperatures uh, uh, ranges so you can open the uh, deck back up to traffic quickly so this uh, will uh, keep the uh, motorist uh, from getting angry and um, also uh, reduce construction costs. Um, so when these materials are applied correctly, um, agencies should expect at least 10 years of service life to these types of products. Um, for um, expansion joint headers, um, the expansion joint materials rely on sound headers for, uh, for the actual joint material for proper bond and proper performance of the joint. Um, deteriorated headers, they will lead to uh, leaking in these joints and it can cause a uh, lot of issues with the uh, bridge beams um, as water does get to them and can cause uh, corrosion under the deck. Um, treatments. Uh, Solutions, we want, obviously, once again, to restore the wide quality uh, of the bridge deck. Um, we also want um, the proper uh, bond of the joint material to the uh, actual header material. We also want to achieve high compressive strengths and flexural strength so that the uh, material can uh, resist uh, vehicle loads. And we want, uh, once again, rapid cure and a wide application of uh, temperature reins, once again, to reduce uh, inconveniences to motorists and also to reduce construction costs. And once these types of uh, materials are applied correctly, you should once again expect uh, life uh, in excess of 10 years. Um, another issue that we see quite a bit and you will hear talked about almost at any um, bridge conference is cracks in deck cracking. Um, and, you know, deck cracks are the primary reason uh, for moisture intrusion, which does cause, as we know, steel corrosion and freeze-thaw damage. Um, even the small shrinkage uh, cracks that occur uh, during curing, uh, if, the, if the deck is improperly cured, can lead to premature de uh, deterioration and um, spalling of the deck uh, surface. Uh, the material should have uh, very low viscosity in order to achieve maximum penetration. Um, we want uh, typically to be uh, 25 centipoise or less uh, to make sure that it gets good penetration into 
all crack sizes. And once the material is cured, it should have a, a good bond strength to the concrete inside the cracks. Uh, and it should also have good flexibility to uh, resist freeze-thaw uh, freeze stresses on the bridge deck and also movement with the bridge deck. Uh, and the material, once cured, should also eliminate the ability for water intrusion. We don't want any more water uh, to penetrate into those uh, cracks. Um, the expected service life of this material should be 10 to 15 years. Um, and that's with inspection. We want to make sure that there are no uh, other cracks that open up after this product has been applied. And if there are uh, subsequent cracks after the material has been applied, we want to go ahead and reapply material again later. Um, there's instances where these types of crack healer or sealers have been in service on bridge decks for over 20 years, and the material is still doing what it's uh, performed to do. Um, Moving on to uh, thin waterproof wearing surface overlays. Um, exposed concrete decks, once again, are uh, susceptible to deterioration due to moisture intrusion. And that's been a theme kind of running through a lot of the presentations today. Um, deterioration begins at the completion of the um, construction. So once the uh, deck is turned over, it's already going to start deteriorating. Um, it, and it also, it will depend on the concrete quality, obviously the depth of the reinforcing steel cover and exposure to uh, moisture and salt. And um, notice I said, once again, the completion of the bridge deck, but you know, in, in some of these peer review um, exchanges that we've been having, um, the topic has come up that, you know, agencies really should have a, a preservation plan already in place once that bridge is turned over to the uh, agency and the end user. So we want to be ahead of the curve when, when preserving these bridge decks. Um, these overlays can be used on new and existing decks. Um, and this obviously will reduce the moisture and the salt intrusion. Materials uh, that we use should have a, a high bond strength, good flexibility, and rare resistant aggregates. We want to have a highly uh, durable aggregates broadcast into these types of systems, and uh, we want them to resist polishing over time. Expected service life of these, these types of products should be in excess of 10 to 15 years, um, even longer. Um, if the concrete surface exhibits cracking uh, on the new deck construction, we want a sealer, healer sealer to be applied um, immediately after um, the construction is done and, and prior to opening to traffic. Um, we believe, and it's been proven, that these uh, overlays can in increase deck life design by 10 to 15 years. Um, for existing decks, obviously we want to have all these spalls repaired and um, before any steel corrosion occurs. Uh, we want to have the cracks and any concrete porosity uh, eliminated with uh, application of sealer materials. Um, and, and these types of products are low cost up front. Um, 50 cents a square foot or less. These thin waterproofing overlays when applied to the deck in, in fair condition or, or good condition, uh, they might look more expensive up front, but the cost to benefit ratio, um, extending the time required for extensive deck rehabilitation, makes them uh, much more cost effective than the cost of the uh, actual overlay going down. All right, Clay. Thanks, Rob. So uh, allow me to read this for a second. It says, through systematic long-term management systems, states can produce stable conditions for the entire inventory of bridges for the lowest life cycle cost. The goal is to find the right preservation balance between fixing immediate problems, conducting pre preventative maintenance, and periodically replacing a reasonable number of old bridges to keep the health of its bridge population stable. So if you can think about that for a minute, I know this is all of our goal. Right, and when I when I go around the country and talk to different agencies, sometimes I can see, not necessarily always in the West, but I can see sometimes where people are a little overwhelmed. Um, and what I, in my own mind, what I can compare it to is, you know, economically in each each of our households, if you're in credit card debt and you're behind the eight ball, it's just like being behind the eight ball with preservation. Okay, if you if you're just reacting and paying the bills, that's all you're going to be able to do. And what the FHWA kind of outlined three different steps. And they're, they're basic, this is an incredibly complicated system, 
process. But there's three basic steps, okay? The first step is basically coming together and having a long-term goal on, the, on a network level, okay? After that, you need to go after funding. And then after that, you need to have specifications and, and have methods where contractors can deliver the right type of procedures. So one of the best things that I've taken from this, and I, by the way, if I can take a minute, this has been an incredible meeting. There's some incredible, some of the greatest minds in the industry and in the nation. This is a powerful group. But one of the biggest things I took from was from Carlos and Josh when they talked about having a systematic methodology, having, you know, deterioration modeling. Uh, curves, being able to predict corrosion, you know, and all the work that Spencer Guthrie is doing. If you can take these type of tools, and I hope I can use them in my, in, in my uh, encounters as I go through industry, if you can take these tools and take them to the right decision makers, and you can say, you know, Mr. Legislator, here's all we're doing. All we're doing is being reactive, but I need some help in order to get out of this hole. You know, compare it to, fin compare it to a financial hole. I think if you, if you get their respect and if you can show them like Spencer and like Carlos did through you know, great illustrations, how important what you're doing together is and they trust you, you can get the money, okay? Um, I, but I really did, didn't want to pass over all the materials without stressing how important having a plan is and I hope that once we have, you know, you kind of put together the need to put together your plan, that you, uh, knowing about these materials will help you uh, with that plan. So considerations. These considerations are going to be, can be, act like a guideline to help you choose which type of materials you want to use. Uh, the condition of the bridge deck is probably paramount. Okay, it's the most important thing. The age, the objective, what are you trying to do? Are we trying to just pothole patch? I mean, what are we doing? Budget, you know, is there a lot of money for it? Can we, can we upgrade on different types of, of preservation measures? Um, Short-term and long-term considerations, the average daily traffic, construction duration, and, clo and lane closures, all of these factors I'll try to address as we, as we go through some of these different types of material, materials. And then the other main thing is cracking, okay? Because some of these materials act differently with cracking. And, and, and we really need to be educated on a high level. And our engineers and our inspectors uh, and us materials people, we all need to be, have a, a really high level education of cracking. We need to be able to look at a crack and say, you know, that's a curing crack. That's a, you know, that, that's a shrinkage crack. Um, this is an active crack. It's by, it's by a, you know, an expansion joint. The, the thing we can, some of the patterns that we can notice is, is the majority of all cracks in, a bridge, in bridge decks all go down to the first layer of the mat, the first, the first mat. What's critical about that is, is if they're going all the way down to the rebar, you've got a direct pathway. It's a highway for chloride ions, especially in a state like Utah where we use a lot of de-icing chemicals. That pathway, the solution's going directly in there. And the solution in our de-icing chemicals are, are far beyond that which, which coastal areas experience. So we, we need to know about that. Um, ACI talks about cracks, and one of the things, the main things that we all need to know and have memorized is, is that they say that any crack below 0 .00, 0 .007 inches needs to be treated. That's a very minuscule crack, okay? Um, and we need, we need to not forget about those if we're going to keep our bridges lasting as long as they can. Uh, so I'm going to go through these materials basically by cost and by level of, uh, level of intensity, if you will. Um, there's a, there's a, sealers out there. Sealers have come a long ways. Back in the day, they used to use linseed oil and gum and you know, all sorts of different things. Um, I will say, from my experience in talking with DOTs, the only sealers that they're really using are, are, are silanes. They used to use some siloxanes. Siloxanes have a, a, high, a larger molecule. They're both, both materials are hydrophobic. Um, we like, on bridges, we like hydrophobic materials just because the pore blocking materials create a slippery surface. Um, and that's, that's a huge deal when we're talking about lots of traffic going over them. Um, the, these materials, these silane sealers, there's scents on the, there's, 
I mean, you're talking several cents per square foot. It's, it's a very cheap cost. Um, one of the things that we need to be aware of is, is that if there's a high level of curing compound on there, or any curing compound on there, a lot of times these sealers aren't going to get into the matrix of the concrete and into the paste and have a chance to react because that curing compound's acting as a, as, a, as a waxy layer that they can't penetrate. And that penetration is really what makes the silanes last long. Uh, I saw some demonstrations from one of the guys back here, and it, I encourage all of you guys, to, if you haven't had an education on silanes, to go back and, and listen to what he, what he has to say and visually see the, the reaction of the water beating up on the silanes. It's pretty impressive. So that's one of the tools you can use. It's very cheap. Um, know about it. I, I would say on vertical surfaces, on bridges, it's a great, it's a great cheap, easy way to, to make our concrete last longer. Um, the thing is specifically about vertical surfaces is, is these silane sealers aren't a cure-all, right? They, if there's a crack, they have a tendency to kind of overhang on the crack on a molecular level, on a really microscopic level, but they're not going to get in and seal the cracks. So, you know, what I, I think vertical surfaces, I think anything to do, any, anywhere where you don't have a lot of cracking, so new bridges, this is a way that if you want to get your bridge through a couple seasons before and let it crack out before you do anything other uh, any other type of preservation, this is a good option for you. Um, healer sealers, there's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on three different types of healer sealers. There's the high molecular weight methacrylate, and I'll start out with, with that. Um, had a lot of success in Cal, in, with Caltrans in California. I will say the unique thing about the high molecular weight methacrylate is, is that it's the only product that really can, can build a lot of strength, the original design strength, back to your concrete. Uh, the figures that I've seen are between 70 and 90 percent. When you're talking about design strength and the, fun, you know, the function of your bridge, that's a big deal. Uh, if, you can, if you can put a material back in there and essentially glue your deck back together and get that strength back, you're ahead of the game, right? And you're at, the, at the same time, you're not only doing that, but you're eliminating the pathway for chlorides, you're el eliminating the pathways for water, uh, and uh, you're, you know, you're, you're healing, the, healing and sealing the deck. Um, I will tell you that high molecular weight methacrylates are a little bit more expensive than some of the others, but on the grand scheme of things, some of the other products we'll talk about on the grand scheme of things, uh, it's, it's pennies on, on the square foot. It's, it's hardly noticeable for any, any big projects. Um, the viscosity of high molecular weight methacrylates is around 20 centipoids. Usually all the specs are limited from 20 centipoids down. Um, you need to know also that when, you, when you're dealing with these different healer sealers, you're, you're dealing with different materials, they're, and they're different by design. So when, you're, when your high molecular weight methacrylates are going to outperform other materials, well, and I, I will include MMAs in that as well, they'll get into the smallest cracks. Their, their penetration levels, we've done, we've done some projects where we've actually had material down into 0 .002, uh, inch crack going nine and beyond nine inches and beyond into a into a, a we, this one was on a, a slab on grade but we were able to core in and actually see the penetration going over nine inches so that's tremendous um, the methyl methacrylates well and I'll maybe back up and finish on one more thing so the high molecular weight methacrylates they're a little more brittle so their their elongation is anywhere between there's two basic formulations or specifications out there. You basically got your 5% elongation specs, and those are, those are, those are the materials that where you're going to get a lot of your design strength back. And then you have other materials that are around the 35% elongation, uh, which takes me into methyl methacrylates, and I'm trying to move here pretty quickly. Uh, methyl methacrylates, the big difference between the high molecular weight and the methyl methacrylates are the elongation. Methyl methacrylates can get around 200% elongation, and they get into those smaller cracks. 200% elongation is pretty significant. So this would mean that, that a material like this would be good in active cracking situations, situations where your cracks are moving, your bridge is moving. Uh, it's not a brittle material. So if you sometimes, if with as we study cracks and as you as you watch in the field, if you were to fill a large crack with a very high modulus material, there's a tendency for that material or that to fill in 
the, the gap, but also the crack will further propagate down the line if it's an active crack. You're, you're putting that stress back into the concrete. So some of these MMAs and epoxies, in those situations, if you can diagnose the crack and know exactly what's going on, you won't have further crack prop propagation and you're not going backwards. Um, in epoxies, you know, you have a lot about the same elongation. I will tell you the epoxies don't have the, that low of viscosity. You're usually talking between 45 and 200 percent, uh, or 200 centipoise, excuse me. That viscosity is about double what those other, the other two products are. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you, if you have a larger crack, I think, I don't know if you guys would agree with me, but we try to get along pretty well. But on, on the larger cracks, usually epoxy uh, fills them up better. I, I've seen different projects where if you have got a large crack and you're filling it with one of the, the more viscous materials, there is a tendency for wash through with, with higher viscosities. And if you can diagnose your cracks, you can dial it in so you don't have as much material flowing through the cracks and it's staying in, in the bridge deck itself. Um, that'll take me to thin bonded polymer overlays. And give me, I'll, I'll rush through this. Thin bonded polymer overlays, thin bonded polymer overlays um, you basically have MMAs, you have epoxies, you have modified epoxies. These technologies have been around for around 30 years plus. They're proven. Uh, as you guys have had a chance to, to watch here today and yesterday, UDOT uses a lot of them. There's a, they're highly specified. They're used in a lot of states. They've been very successful. If applied right, it's, it's within the realm of, of possibility to get up to 30 years out of a bridge, out of your, out of your overlay. I would say 15 years. If you get 15 years on a, on a high ADT bridge deck, I think you should feel pretty good about that. Um, know your materials when you're out there specifying it. I would, I, I would encourage you guys to talk with uh, amongst other states. See what has worked well in other states. If, if you're looking into doing more of this, uh, what materials are, are working well, what other people's experiences are. The, the benefit of thin bonded polymer overlays is, is you're, the prices nowadays are getting down to the point where a thin bonded polymer overlay is about as expensive as an asphalt overlay, especially if you've got a membrane underneath it. You're talking three to, a lot of times three to five dollars a square foot installed on large projects. That's very economical and there's, what you're getting is you're getting a moisture and vapor barrier that keeps all of the contaminants and all the water from getting in. Um, which is a good, a good slingshot into this, this SHARP study. So to give you guys some perspective on these materials, the SHARP study says that in, in new bridge decks with the 1.5 inch average cover, they should show signs of chloride, in, in chloride corrosion intrusion um, in 13 years. Okay, and that's, this is in average areas. I don't think this would be in Utah from what Spencer Guthrie said, you're talking one year, maybe two years to get to that corrosion initiation. And once, you, once you're getting corrosion initiation, there's some diffusion, but you got corrosion going on. It's active. Um, the damage has been started. For others, when you're putting a healer sealer on, you're gonna get 25 years if you're maintaining it. You're gonna get an extra, basically double the, life, the lifespan of that bridge deck. And with a polymer overlay or other overlays, you're gonna get up to 77 additional years before you're getting uh, corrosion initiation. That's a big deal, okay? When we're talking about responsibly using uh, monies and being good steward of taxpayer monies, dollars, these are incredible tools that'll help you get away from just doing pothole patch repair. Um, keep, you, keep you building nice, big structures. Uh, polyester concrete is probably the most uh, durable, it definitely is the most durable of all the materials. Uh, you're, you're talking about, instead of a, a thin bonded polymer overlay that's usually in a 3 8 inch layer, you're talking about a 3 quarter inch, you can go nine, up to 9 inches per lift. Uh, it's a, it's a, a tool you guys can use if you've got drainage issues. I know one of the biggest things that we can do is keep the water going where we want to go. If you've got drainage issues, I think this is a great tool for you. Uh, as far as major rehabilitation, I have said this to other people, and, I, and I'll say it in front of you guys. I, I think that the last, the last step you have to keeping a deck from, to, to keeping your deck before demolishing it and building a new one or, or a redeck is a, is a polyester polymer concrete. 
Uh, they've been used very successfully in, in California. Uh, I think w as we, in closing, I'll just say, you know, there's a lot of great materials out there. They've been, they've been established. Uh, they've been put to the test. Um, as you guys talk with amongst each other, everybody's doing different things. Feel free. That, I mean, the greatest thing about the Bridge Preservation Partnership to me is, is it is a partnership. We're interchanging. Even my, my buddies up here, I mean, we, have, we may have different ideas and different, different beliefs, but at the end of the day, it's an exchange, and working with each other makes, makes us better, makes us understand what other people are doing. And, and there's a place for all these products, and there's a place for all the products that, in, in, your, in your spec books. Um, if you use them right, they're great tools that will allow you to uh, extend the life of your bridge decks and be more efficient be able to, and be able to do more work. Um, and that's what we have. If you, well, I'm sure these guys will stand up next to me. And if you have any questions, questions, we'd be more than happy to answer some questions for you. As an industry, what percentage, what percentage of damage on the deck surface you would say that it wouldn't qualify for thin or rigid overlays? We had this talk, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a difficult question, but I wanted to take It's a wonderful uh, question. And I think you're going to find that we have different interpretations of what that is. Um, I will tell you from my perspective, I'm sure Greg will go after. Uh, Missouri DOT did a study. And in the study, it basically said that, and you can go back, it's, it's, it's referenced in SHARP, one of the strategic highway research program um, studies. Basically, it said that the decks and the overlays that perform the best were on the best quality decks, best quality concrete, the newer decks. However, to me, that's, that's very predictable, right? It's like saying if you do better prep work, you're going to have a better finished product. Um, we've, we've had success going on, on some decks that are in rough shape. Now, I think if you're, if you're prescribing an, a thin bonded polymer overlay on a deck with 50% DLAM, I think that's a bad idea. I don't know what the exact number is. But I will tell you that even if your deck's in terrible condition, if you're putting an overlay on it, you're stopping the vehicle, you're stopping that water, and you're, you're not freezing the corrosion, but you're, you're allowing the corrosion to diffuse. There's Flick's law, second law of diffusion, which talks about corrosion that it actually goes down. You're still going to have corrosion going on if you've got an overlay, but you're slowing it down, you're, you're breaking that pathway, you're breaking the chain. And, and you have to have realistic, realistic expectations with these things. These materials aren't designed to be the end all. You know, there's still things going on in your concrete if it's contaminated. And I'm sure Greg has s no, some I mean, thoughts. <laughs> the only thing I'll, I'll add to that, and, and, and Clay's right, I think, and we've had this discussion in some of the, the sessions, I, if the deck's in better condition, the likelihood that a thin overlay is, is going to fail is, is lower. And the worst ca condition that the deck is, um, you know, if, if you have map, map cracking patterns, the likelihood is that, that you have concrete that wants to come up, even if you sound it and it sounds okay by sounding with a chain, uh, it's already kind of in the process of wanting to come up. Chances are if, it's probably uh, some form of initiated corrosion of the reinforcing steel below, unless you have ASR or something like that. So, I mean, it's not that you're right or, or wrong or anyone, any of us up here are right or wrong. I think the point that you made, the better condition the deck, the likelihood uh, that the, the, a thin, more rigid system is going to last longer. And then, as, as Spencer mentioned earlier, um, if you're using a lot of de-icing chemicals, you're going to probably receive more benefit installing them earlier anyway. So the cost of benefit goes, or the benefit to cost goes up substantially in a situation like where we are here in Utah where you use a lot of de-icing chemicals. So the, that's all I wanted to add, yeah. add to that. Well, the reason I asked the question is the, the damage that occurs on the deck could be because of corrosion, could be because of other things. So when the owner is trying to make a decision, can I put an overlay or not? Um, the question that comes up is, you know, is this damage sufficient enough that it would allow me to put an overlay? And, you know, do you tie that to any chloride levels, profiles, or do you tie it to damage? If so, what kind of damage? 
I'm, as an industry, I'm w wanting your input on what do you go by? Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because we actually did have this conversation while we were putting the presentation together. And I'll say, uh, as a manufacturer, if I'm putting a, a thin bonded polymer overlay on a concrete, I want to have at least 250 PSI on a pull-off test. If I've got that, I am completely confident that that concrete is in good shape. Now, if we go back to delaminations and we're talking about pothole patch repairs, in my perspective, as industry, if you've done the correct job of repairing your pothole patch, it should not be considered a delamination at that point. It's, it, to me, it's in good shape. Now, so, we need to be careful, I will tell you that. I think the difference between being more conservative with saying, okay, once you have more than 5% spalling from delamination caused by the corrosion reinforcing steel, or you say 25%, it's really relative because as Clay suggested, you're gonna come in and you're gonna repair all those areas that, that you drag a chain around or whatever GPR, whatever method you use to determine whether there's delaminations, you're gonna remove that unsound concrete, you're gonna make the repairs. So the, I think the next question is, what state of corrosion is the rest of the deck in? And what level of moisture and chloride content are you maintaining within that deck? There's a lot of really good data and Spencer brought up some very good, clear, specific data, how to correlate that to, to the corrosion of the steel and chloride content, half cell potential, and, and other non-destructive methods. Um, there's a lot of matrices that are out there from research studies that will give you all that data. So it depends on how much money you want to stand, spend. But as Clay suggested, if you make sound repairs um, and you put, you put a thin bonded overlay and your deck's in, in you know, decent shape, you're gonna get some life out of it. Uh, if the deck's in really poor condition, you're probably not gonna get much life out of it. If the deck's in really good condition, chances are you're gonna get much more life out of it. Now that assumes you install it properly and do all the proper prep. So I don't know if that, yeah, I, that's kind I, of in line. I, I agree. Um, I'll just say that if you do nothing, you're a lot worse case scenario. It's, it's, that's the worst thing you can do is do nothing. Let's so. say if you have a 10% damage and you prepare properly, you place it properly, what would be the life of the overlay? Would you assume a 30-year life? Would you assume a rigid overlay I'm talking about? You know, I think you can, you can assume 15 years, but you have to understand, and, and I've gone through this with Josh at some point on some, on some other, uh, on some bridges where they'd had an overlay and they got pothole, potholes that propagated after the overlay was put on. So you, you need to understand, and there, you can do it through half cell ana analysis, you can do it through uh, you know, a number Chloride of Chloride content. Yeah. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that you can do, but you, if you put an overlay on, you have to understand that if it's an old deck, it still has contaminants. You're st you still have, let me, t let me put it this way. All these, all these chemicals that are in your concrete are changing the pH and changing the alkalinity of your concrete. If you can keep the water out of it, those chemicals aren't damaging anything. But if, it, if those chemicals go into a solution and you're providing a pathway and everything else, you're, you're a lot worse if you're getting that water in there than if you're just basically keeping the water out. You can't keep all of it out. Even with an overlay on top, you're gonna get some air, some humidity underneath, but at least you're limiting it. So I, I would say that if you have realistic expectations, if you do your homework, these materials are going to, are going to do what they're supposed to do. But you, you, you kind of need to do your homework and you kind of need to ask the material to do what it's designed to do and, and not be expecting it to. So to sum it up, I would say you have to have some kind of data to make a decision yeah, whether you want to put it the, the more The more data you have, the better decision you're gonna be able to make. If you have corrosion potential, existing corrosion, you do all your patches, you have to determine how much corrosion potential and how much existing, you, you're a corrosion guy. You know this, yeah. So you, you know, we're 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 preaching to the choir here, but 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 to answer for the rest of these folks here, if if you want to do more extensive non-destructive analysis, you can determine um, a curve on what that deck is going to do underneath that overlay. That's really what's going on. It's not about the overlay itself; it's about the substrate. And so, if you have high chloride content, you know, along with uh, correlating half cell potentials, and you can determine that there's a lot of p corrosion already happening, even if you do your patching and repairs, you can suggest that the substrate, the condition of the substrate is gonna go downhill. So what that does to the overlay system 
There's too many variables to qualify or quantify that. If you want to make very conservative um, decisions, then you can expect a longer life cycle, a greater benefit to cost. If, if you need to do these repairs, you can, you, you know, you're rolling the dice a little bit more, but like Clay suggested, you may get, have a deck that you do 25% uh, small repairs on that deck, you put your overlay down, you may get 15 years out of it. There's so many variables that go into, into one, those. One thing I'll add, and let's just, let's just talk about really quickly. If one thing that Utah does and other states do is they add a little more thickness above the mat, two and a half inches. And if you've got concrete that's in bad shape and it's chloride ion concentration, a lot of times the NCHRP actually talks about milling off that top layer of the deck if you've got enough space there, you can mill it off, get rid of the worst part of the concrete, get back into good concrete and put an overlay on. So that's another option for you to do. Yeah. It's a little bit more, it's obviously more expensive. Right. Thank you. I, so, I appreciate it. Sure. Question, but I to Great question. We, we, just so you know, we, we went around well, on this in the emails yeah. beforehand, and it's, it's, it's a good topic, and I think we all, we all learn a lot from it. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah, I have uh, just one more question over here. Um, so um, from your perception on how DOTs are treating specifically crack sealers, um, we've talked a lot about uh, doing some of that investigation. Is it uh, working crack due to live load? Is it shrinkage? Um, and then matching the product for that. Are you finding that DOTs are, are doing that? Are they specifying epoxy, high mod, low mod, MMA? I mean, the various things, are they, specifying a crack sealer and then it's up to the contractor to pick whichever one is cheapest. What I see a lot of is, is you have a, a list of, of materials on your QPL list from high molecular weight methacrylates to epoxies to whatever and it doesn't matter. The contractor is going to get and accept the cheapest bid so whichever product is, is the least expensive is more than likely going to end up being used on that bridge deck. So they're really in, in my opinion, there's, there's really no consideration for, for what you're talking about. It, it's, it's, the, it's the low cost denominator, unfortunately. Well, Oregon sometimes. or Washington, one of the two will, will specify a high mod or a low mod material. Uh, Oregon will specify a high or low mod, yeah. but I think that's as far as we go. Which yeah, it's, Florida it's does probably, it too. it's the only, if you, I, don't, I don't run in circles in Florida, but it's the only state in the West that I'm aware of that's actually di diagnosing that type of material for that type of crack, which is a great, we could have a whole study on that too. Yep, and a whole uh, day's worth of yeah, discussion. Yeah, absolutely. But, but in general, you're just not seeing that. No. that level in general, of yeah, they're all states are, are different and, and, you know, I think you were just uh, going to yeah. say that. They're all different. All states are different. <laughs> Some have their preferences. Yep. All right. Well, with that, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah.